Hello, everyone. This is Dark Journalist. Tonight, a very special episode for you, an interview with Oxford scholar and Giza Death Star book series author, Dr. Joseph Farrell. Tonight, Dr. Farrell will go deep on the mystical connection of NASA, the mystery schools, Masonic symbolism, and the elite's obsession with Illuminati symbolism. Please join us now. Joseph, uh, great to have you back. Thank you for having me, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> if only they knew what we were If talking. only they knew what we talk about before we start recording. That's right. <laughs> um, you're coming off this fantastic book, The Demon in the Acre, and um, the Plasma Beings piece is ricocheting everywhere. As I was um, getting through that book, I went back in my mind to some of the conversations that you and I have had about Mars. And I realized Mm -hmm. we never define Mars in the missions thereof and the mystical aspects Mm -hmm. in in a total way. It's always come up. And uh, some of the fascinating links, I think, that you've put together around Mars crisscrossed with some research that I was doing on Gordon Cooper Mm -hmm. and Von Braun Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of their statements about Mars and going to Mars by 1981. (laughs) <laughs> which was the original plan, apparently. Uh, Joseph, Destination Mars, what is it, and what is kind of the secret inside of NASA relating to Mars and the obsession around Mars? And then you have, for example, Elon Musk saying, we uh-huh. need to bring the light of consciousness to Mars with our chemical SpaceX rocket. Well, if I were to guess, and and I stress to everybody that's listening that that, I, I'm guessing here, and and um, there have been lots of people that have made similar guesses. You know, Richard Hoagland has made a, a lengthy career out of trying to read NASA's clues and hints and, and so on regarding Mars. But if I were to guess whatever it is that has fascinated NASA uh, since the Von Braun days... Um, Number one, I, I suspect that there is a, a cadre within that intelligence space community that has been looking at ancient texts in a similar manner to the way I, I have in, in my books mm-hmm. as being legacies of a lost civilization and that the events that those texts recount have a a solid core of truth in them. The second thing I think that NASA is, and I'm I'm quite convinced of this, that NASA knows is that ever since they have sent the, the space probes to the other planets, and particularly beginning with the Viking craft, the, the two Viking uh, probes that went to Mars and photographed the face and photographed Sidonia and ever since then the Soviet probes, the European probes that have taken all of these pictures of Phobos and monoliths and obelisks and pyramids and even in, in, in one case that Richard Hoagland mentioned uh, a distant figure off by Olympus Mons that looks very much like the Sphinx. Yes. Uh, And since then, there has been a whole Mars anomaly community that has poured over the photographs that NASA has released. And I have looked at a lot of these photographs, and I defy anybody to look at them and tell me that they do not contain a high level of anomalous features that by any sort of amateur geologist lights cannot be explained by those kinds of processes. We are indicating a human civilization. Indicating somebody's civilization on Mars, you know, whether human or not, I don't know. My suspicion is like yours. It probably was human. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I've, I've, been um, 
pursuing this hypothesis that we have genetic cousins out there. Right. You know, if if they're not Homo sapiens sapiens, the species, they're at least Homo sapiens, the genus. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, I, I think that we've got some sort of genetic cousin out there, and I've thought that for a very long time. Uh, you read the biblical text, you read the ancient Mesopotamian text, the Popol Vuh, the, the Vedic text, you know, they're full of this stuff. So I don't have any problem with it. So I think NASA has known on the basis of their space probes and probably on the basis of some sophisticated uh, computer-enhanced photographic analysis that they've known for a long time what's up there. Interesting. Uh, that, that's, you know, I, I, I don't see how it can be anything else. And, you know, they, they have tried at various points at, at various points to to dim the tide of public speculation about it. You know, back in the 90s, we had the cat box image of the face on Mars, to quote Art Bell. And, you know, <laughs> and that, that long ongoing discussion between him and Richard Hoagland. And again, I think NASA lost that one, and much to the credit of Richard Hoagland for sticking to his guns there. Right. Because... Hoagland's point was that when you when you increase the resolution on photographs to much greater resolution, you're going to end up with a photograph that looks highly degraded and doesn't look like much. But with lower resolution, and you're you're doing resolution on that basis you see the the underlying image of what was there. So it's like taking a picture of a sugar cube as you put water on it and taking a time lapse of it. And the, the higher resolution is going to degrade the sugar cube more, and the lower resolution is, is going to preserve the original shape much better. So I think Hoagland won that, that whole debate, and as a result, what you saw happen in that community that was following the Martian anomalies, largely due to Richard Hoagland, was that community spread out from, from the Enterprise mission people and has now become part of the general phenomenon in the space watching community. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, in a certain sense, um, Hoagland, so to speak, lost control of it at that mm -hmm. point as it, as it grew. Right. But I think, you know, I don't think he would object to that mm -hmm. um, because now you have all sorts of people, not just him. You have all sorts of people looking at these photos that NASA is publishing. Yeah. And now, um, just to continue this to the final point here, by asking the question about Mars, what you've done is you've also opened the door because with the expansion of that community, what they've also done is they've started looking at photographs from other NASA probes to other planets, mm -hmm. particularly to the moons of, of Jupiter and Saturn and so on. And even, even Pluto and, and, and the little planetoid out there that they've called Charon, uh, you know, they've, they've poured over photographs of those celestial bodies. And again, they're finding some weird stuff, you know, yes. that shouldn't be there. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, the solar system is a junkyard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Excellent points. Um, that's really true. And I remember one of the interesting things is this Buzz Aldrin character who shows up in so many different ways and had that intense career and controversial as an astronaut. Um, but one of the things that he said was, oh, you know, we did find an obelisk that was on Phobos. He yes. Said this, uh, you know, he was in the middle of this whole thing. We know he's let little things slip out over time right. or whatever. There wasn't a lot of follow-up on this. No. But um, this idea of the obelisk, and again, 2001 Space Odyssey, the things that they were feeding out in the 60s about what they were discovering. Mm -hmm. um what is it? What's the imagery there with the obelisk and all the knowledge sort of contained there? And then with Aldrin bringing it back up in relation to Phobos of all things. Well, there, I know what he's talking about. There is a picture of, of something on, on the Martian moon of Phobos that 
casts a regular shadow that would be very similar to the shadow cast by an obelisk, like, you know, the George Washington Monument in Washington will cast a shadow. Mm -hmm. uh, and it'll be a regular shadow. Um, this is what you see not only on Phobos, but there's actually a couple of other places on Mars where you see these things sticking up from the surface that, that cast an obelisk-like shadow. Um, Phobos, I think what, personally, I think what Aldrin was, was doing when he said that is and again I don't I I I take the view that these people don't say things by accident. Right. In other words, I think someone told Buzz Aldrin, uh, drop this in a conversation, you mm -hmm. know, uh, in the next couple of weeks. Just drop it in there. Make it make it look like you kind of lost control and blurted something out that you shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. You know, and and the reason I'm saying that, Danny, is go back to that famous episode uh, of Frasier when John Glenn oh, yeah. was, was the guest on Frasier, and you've got Frasier and Roz off in the control booth yammering away and having an argument while Glenn is going on and on about UFOs, you know, and, <laughs> and, and they're not paying a bit of attention to him. Um, I think Aldrin was was kind of in that sort of situation he was deliberately letting out something and i think it was because they wanted people to look at phobos right there's all as i put in my books there's all sorts of weird stuff going on with the moons of mars mm -hmm. not the least of which there was a russian astronomer by the name of Shkl uh, shklovsky i think something like that that wrote a book called Intelligent Life in the Universe. Mm -hmm. This is in my book, um, uh, Hidden, Hidden Finance and Clash of Civilizations, one of, right. those, one of those books. Yes. And Carl Sagan translated the whole book into English and published it without the Russian author's knowledge or permission. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Talk about your plagiarism example. <laughs> yeah. Um, and did this, and in the book, the, the Russian points out, Shklovsky, I think is his name, the Russian astronomer points out that the real mystery about Mars is why did it take so dang long for anyone to discover the moons of Mars? Hmm. And he points out that, that the telescopic technology in Isaac Newton's time, would have permitted them to discover those satellites. Wow. And everybody's looking at Mars, mm -hmm. and no one's seeing these satellites. So the hmm. question is, why did no one make the discovery? And hmm. add to that, Jonathan Swift, the satirist in Gulliver's Travels, right. talks about two satellites of Mars, a whole century before their official discovery. That's incredible. And he, and he talks about them in such a way as to carefully and correctly predict their orbital periods. Okay. Wow. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so either, either he knows something and somebody else knows something and knows that Mars has two satellites and they're not talking. And then the question becomes, well, why aren't they talking? Hmm. You know, on and on we go. So I think, yeah, Ed Aldrin or is is trying to draw attention to Phobos for some reason. And That's right about the time, you'll recall that he did that, the European Space Agency had a probe that was going to Mars and was going to do rad radar tomography of Phobos, mm. which they did. Remember that? Yes. And lo and behold, and Hoagland, you know, you know, Hoagland, he was all over this like a fly on honey. <laughs> uh, they, the Europeans discovered that Phobos was outgassing. <laughs> so, wow. In other words, it's hollow mm -hmm. and it's pressurized. <laughs> Incredible. And the radar tomography, Hoagland had this up on his website. I'm sure he still does, but I don't remember what the paper was called. 
Uh, but he he posts the graph of of the radar tomography that the Europeans had published on their website, and what you see inside of Phobos are two gigantic hollow chambers. And he Hoagland himself says, you know, this is the golden arches because that <laughs> it's, oh, wow. it's a Martian McDonald's. <laughs> that, that's that's the pattern that the radar tomography made. Wow. So, so yeah, the implication that it's completely artificial. The, yeah, that's a strong implication, is it's an artificial body. And that takes us back to the Russian astronomer, because the Russian astronomer basically came to the conclusion well, was that, well, someone parked them there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why no one noticed them earlier. They weren't there. Unbelievable. You know, I wonder well, what they did to this guy after he put the book out. <laughs> well, the problem is, this is the other interesting thing. Inside the Soviet Union, they were much more open and willing to entertain publicly entertain ah, these kinds of wild hypotheses I see. than they were in the West. You know, Sputnik magazine, I, I don't know if you ever saw the, the old Soviet Sputnik magazine. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a friend in Sioux Falls that my parents played cards with, and he he was a subscriber to Sputnik. So, you know, he got all these Russian English language magazines that were really interesting reading, yeah. <laughs> needless to say. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it. But uh, the Sputnik magazine actually published the, the first, uh, in the 1970s, the first version of our moon being a spaceship. You wow. know that that was the conclusion that the Russians came to. Let's publish it, and they did. Incredible, <laughs> you know. So they were doing. They were willing to entertain these kinds of uh, hypotheses publicly, mm-hmm. and without vilifying the scientists that were putting them out there as as serious science and as as something worthy of of your attention and consideration. So I'm not at all surprised that the Russians would do this. Um, I think in that respect, they're much more honest about things than, than our scientists are. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've seen that in relation to psychic activity as yep. well. They're, they're yep. far more open to yep. it. And that's how you can see that there's a real censorship thing that goes on with this. Yes. Um the moons, just strategically, let's uh-huh. think of a spacefaring group that comes in to different solar systems. These uh-huh. moons would be very strategic yes. in terms of supplies, travel, communications, yes. and everything else. And monitoring. Yeah, absolutely. Monitoring. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, I have a something I've been looking into recently, which is all about the Mormons' belief that there yes. were people on the moon that they were going to spread the gospel to. Right. And there's some letters of uh, Smith giving instruction to one of his disciples there about, you know, how this is going to happen and everything. Right. How does that, uh, what is the, because there's always a weird piece in the Mormons that they're tied into some kind of mystery knowledge. Well, I don't, believe it or not, Mormonism is, is one of the American sex, cults, I don't know what you'd call it, uh, that I am not sufficiently familiar with. I do know that it's coming out of of what was called the warmed over or the burned out district in New York and, and that region that was so heavily evangelized by the by the New England Calvinists that it really became kind of a hotbed for all of this kind of thinking and activity. My Hmm. suspicion has always been that crazy as the story of Joseph Smith sounds, you know, discovering golden tablets that he could only read with a special set of spectacles. Yes. Um, You know, it sounds, (laughs) it sounds completely wacky. Yeah. Um, 
I've I've always strongly suspected that there has to be some solid core of truth, and that maybe the public myth is just that. It's it's a bit of deliberate disinformation mm. to distract from whatever it was that he may have discovered or found or been led to or what have you. Because his, and the reason why I say that, Daniel, is that his is not the only story of golden tablets that are somehow a part of a lost archive. And the other one concerns something in, in Mesoamerica called the Taos, T-A-O-S, the Taos Gold. Uh -huh. Where again, you have a story of golden tablets that had some sort of writing or symbolism on them mm. that were part of an archive. Guess who made it part of his end of life quest to find? Who? Neil Armstrong. Oh, right. Yeah. So, huh. in other words, Whatever's going on with the Mormons and space, again, I think you have definite indications that somebody somewhere knows something. I wouldn't be a bit surprised that in the bowels of the hierarchy of, of the Mormon church, there are people that know a lot of this. I suspect strongly that the Mormon um obsession with genealogy. I mean, they have one of the most complete and old genealogical and genetic libraries in the world, you know, because they research this stuff because it's part of their belief that you, you can baptize, uh, get baptized for the dead. Right. Okay. And, you know, they've got biblical New Testament precedent for that. There is that expression. Interesting. In one of the letters in Corinthians that, you know, the standard churches don't know what to do with. You know, mm. I'm Orthodox. I can tell you that no one in the Orthodox church knows exactly how to explain that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's there. My point is it's there. And you've, mm -hmm. got, you've got these strange things going on. And you've got this strange business with gold tablets and Joseph Smith. And yet... When you when you sit down and boil out the central essence of that story, what you see is Neil Armstrong doing a very similar thing. Interesting. A century later. Yeah. You know, how does that work? Well, these astronauts and the things they get into once they leave the profession are always very interesting to me. Uh, oh, yeah. Gordon Cooper. Yes. I was reading. He goes into, you know, the jungles and he finds all this Olmec uh, yes. statues and yes. all this archaeology, these guys are turning to archaeology because obviously in that profession you can see things from above yeah, and yeah. you can see cities and all the rest of it and yeah. you become naturally a, a point of intelligence for these people on the archaeological side. Yes. Well, you know, the there is an archaeology that happens, I'm convinced, from, from outer space. Mm -hmm. with with radar tomography. I mean, we've seen that already. We've talked about that already with the European Space Agency's uh, radar tomography probe to Phobos. What they're doing is archaeology. That's what they're doing. Right. We had that recent story, and I've got a blog coming up about it, uh, of the subsurface water on Mars that they finally decided, okay, what we're looking at on our radar tomography is a lot of subsurface water. On Mars. Huh. Enough, incidentally, Daniel, to cover the entire planet wow. to a depth of about four to eight meters. Incredible. Now, what you've really got to ask yourself is, okay, if there's that much subsurface water on Mars gathered into a few places where it froze into ice, what possible geological mechanism did that? Mm. Answer? None. Huh. To do that, I think you have to have a sudden cataclysmic event mm -hmm. that strips away enough of the atmosphere of Mars that everything is suddenly cooled and that will strip away most of the surface water and surface features of the planet 
and then suddenly freeze and then get buried over the eons by surface dust and so on. Wow. And that's what we see on Mars. One half of Mars is actually geologically lower on, on the median than the other half of Mars. So it looks like that half of Mars has been suddenly scoured and concussed by a flood. Mm -hmm. And the other half, you know, uh, suffered the aftermath of that. So in other words, as I've said many times, Daniel, the best evidence for a planetary-wide flood exists not on this planet, but on Mars. Oh, right. Yeah, right. Wow. Wow. So the the story of the flood, in fact, could be an echo from an interplanetary journey. I think the story of the flood is an echo of the interplanetary war. Fascinating. Uh, because if if you if you if you have Mars as the satellite of a larger planet that was there and that was water bearing along with Mars itself, what you would have, first of all, is a double planetary system, which would be a heat sink. So it's entirely possible that you, you would have uh, evolved life on Mars over time. And then suddenly you explode the parent planet in that system. So what happens to Mars? Well, if that parent planet is a water-bearing planet, the shock wave hits Mars. Right. And you've got a planetary-wide flood, and you've got a catastrophe that is going to freeze a lot of the remaining water overnight. And it's going to create a lot of what? It's going to create a lot of asteroids. Mm -hmm. Those asteroids are going to show all the conditions of an explosion, high-pressure uh, rock formations, diamonds, in other mm -hmm. words. Uh, it's going those those rocks out there are also going to have water. There's going to be water on them, and so on and so forth. So, in other words, what I'm suggesting is, yeah, if you look at the geological evidence of the solar system and couple it with our old myths about a war of the gods, that's what you've got. Fascinating. That's what you've got. And if I can see it, if a hack from South Dakota can see this. Trust me, the guys at NASA can see it. Right. You know. Um, <laughs> it, right, we're not going to get any truth out of them in relation no. to these artifacts and things. No, of course not. Um, and there's a weird messaging thing that goes on around Mars. I remember yeah. when Joe Biden met the Pope, and he starts babbling on about Satchel Paige. <laughs> <laughs> who was this um, guy in the Negro Baseball League who was yeah. this incredible batter that they wouldn't let in. And he goes off talking about him as soon as he meets him. And, and I'm sure the Pope's like, who? <laughs> <laughs> we know that Pope Francis also, you know, weird talk about, you know, it's okay if there are aliens, that's cool, you know. Uh, <laughs> he's fine with it. And it's interesting to me because when I looked into it just a half inch deep, I found that there was a whole thing on Mars that was named after the different figures in that same baseball league as Satchel Page. And these okay. different quadrants in Mars named after this player or that oh, player. Oh, I didn't know that. Interesting. So I thought as soon as Biden shows up talking Satchel Page, we were in very strange territory. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh, and they were, and they thought it was a big gaffe on his part. It's like, why is Biden talking about Satchel Page? But this is the type of thing that they do with steganography in space. Right. Obviously, if you've got a whole thing named after baseball code. league players, yeah. yeah. Um, but that that whole coding piece is interesting, and I, I guess what I'd like to do is address the mystery side of it, and then bring it back through a figure like von Braun, who obviously came out of that mystery okay. uh, side of it. But if you look at uh, things like Rudolf Steiner's work, he's mm -hmm. got a, a whole depth thing there about Mars and the fact even that, you know, Buddha was on Mars and <laughs> things of this nature, <laughs> which are really intense. Mm -hmm. And then you get to Casey's work and he's talking about developing our bodies on Mars. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole mystical 
piece going along there, but also there's kind of a secret legend in terms of origin myths that we go back to Mars. And this seems to be the thing that you hear a lot. And it seems to be in the back of the heads of the elites in this case, you know, people like uh, our friend Musk who are saying, Oh, you know, we need to go back to Mars and preserve consciousness. What's going on there in terms of the mystical crossover with what we see now as kind of the ruling technocracy? Well, I definitely think that, that, there is something in in our collective union unconscious that drives us to Mars. You know the the Zulu tribe in in South Africa wow. has as part of its lore that they came to this planet from Mars, and they came on Amerikava. That's oh. their word for it. And you yeah. know, this I, I've mentioned this several times, I think, on your show. That's also the Hebrew word for ship. Yes. You know. Right. Yeah. That's uh, straight out of the Kabbalah, is it not? It, it's a vessel. Yeah. It's a, you know, that's what it is. So I, you know, I find it fascinating, you know, not only these little linguistic tells, but that you you would have a a tribe of people that is about as far as you can get from biblical Hebrews that have this mythology about Mars, you know, and you look at a lot of those African tribes, the Dogon being another example of their origins, they trace to some planet that revolves around the star Sirius, you know, right. all of this crazy stuff. So why are and we that's drawn- advanced astronomy? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I pointed out in the Giza Death Star uh, destroyed years and years ago that if you do a a profile artistic representation of the face at Sidonia and compare that profile representation to an ancient Babylonian inscription of the god Nergal, they are amazingly similar. And here's the problem. Nergal is also Erdekal, is also Hercules. Oh, right. Is also Ares, is also Mars. Fascinating. So the god that the Babylonians associate with Mars even has, by some amazing coincidence, air quotes. <laughs> by some amazing coincidence, resembles a profile artistic representation of of the face at Sidonia as artists have depicted it looking at the Viking photographs. That is fascinating. You know, why? How many of these coincidences do we have to pile up before we realize there's something going on with this planet in human history? Right. Yeah. And the other the other problem is why is Mars in in all Western mythology persist and by Western I, I'm including Sumerian, Akkadian, and so on. Why is it the planet associated with war? Yes. You know, why? Well, I suspect it's because that whole constellation of flood of um, war of the gods and so on of exploding planets really happened and it's all part of one gigantic picture that somehow over time became fragmented mm-hmm. so do these do the people at NASA know this absolutely they do because the other sad part of this and again uh, hats off to Richard Hoagland because he was the one that really originally, pointed all of this out and made a a long argued case that you had at least three mystical or mystery school streams involved inside of NASA, the Masons, the magicians and the Nazis. Those were, those were his three. Right. So, you know, he, he wrote a whole book about this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and again, I think the case that he made, at least on a prima facie basis, is is a solid one. 
Mm-hmm. I think you see evidence of all three of those different uh, approaches to to occult lore and so on at work inside of NASA. Absolutely. That's fascinating as well, um, because when you get on such a deep level of kind of mystery knowledge that the Masons are on, for example. Yes. Um, when they have such representation that a Masonic flag gets taken up to the moon. Right. Um, the entire structure has a foundation of mystery. Yeah. Yeah. So you're talking about magical rites right off the bat as soon as you land. Yes. On the moon. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's lunar landing as, as ceremonial magic. Yes. I mean, there's no other way to put it. Incredible. And, you know, let, let's go further. Why are you landing your your first landing on the moon on the 25th anniversary of the Nazi bomb plot against Hitler? That is fascinating. You know, whose eagle is really landing here? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, the eagle has landed. <laughs> yeah, the eagle. Yeah, which one? Are, you know, <laughs> German, American, which one? You know, um, on and on it goes. And then you look at, and again, Hoagland has has to get the credit for pointing this out. When you look at uh, Dr. Farouk Albaz, the Egyptian man that was heading NASA's effort to pinpoint the landing sites on the moon. Right. Why an Egyptian? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Really yeah. interesting point. Yeah. Yeah, very. We don't know much about him. Well, he again, he's the guy picking the landing sites and he's a physicist. Wow. And by the way, he had some connection with with Lambert Dolphin and that whole examination of of the Great Pyramids via cosmic rays. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Wow. On and on we could go, folks. <laughs> You just jumped ahead of a question I was going to ask you sure. later about Luis Alvarez. Okay. And uh, we might as well deal with it now. Might as well. <laughs> <laughs> Luis Alvarez, part of the Robertson panel, uh, uh-huh. deep expert on UFOs, physicist uh-huh. from that period. It's a very interesting <laughs> trajectory as a career. Because yeah. he, <laughs> 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 he goes from being the kind of point man on the Robertson UFO panel in 52 mm-hmm. with Lloyd Berkner and our other friends like mm-hmm. Alan Hynek. Mm-hmm. And then he becomes the point man for saying that the Zapruder film scientifically shows a shot from the back. So he becomes part of the cover up uh-huh. and he becomes the main go-to physicist for giving this information. So everyone who's quoted mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Time Magazine, Life Magazine, when they all quote about the Zapruder film, he's the guy who says, yep. I've proved this is how it's a shot from Oswald and all the rest. So he's part of that establishment piece. So we've got the UFO file, we've got the JFK assassination, but Joseph then in the 70s, he shows up and he is going through this process of trying to track hidden chambers inside the Great Pyramid using yes. cosmic rays. That's correct. That's the place that you were getting to, but how yes. strange is that that you have this other guy who's connected with spotting the moon landing sites? Well, if you recall, that study of, of looking for chambers, in the in particularly in the Great Pyramid and then the Second Pyramid, the Pyramid of Sephirn, right. uh, using cosmic rays, they discovered something very odd that I mentioned in my pyramid books and we're just getting started with Alvarez folks. So just bear (laughs) with me, (laughs) bear with me here. Stage one, stage one. Yes. (laughs) When, when they ran the tapes of the findings that they had recorded at the pyramids, they apparently ran them through the computers at the university of Cairo. And I have never found any external corroboration of this story, although I mention it in my my Giza Death Star books, um, because I find it interesting and I find it plausible, okay? 
when they ran the the tapes of their studies, the cosmic ray studies through the computer at the University of Cairo, they got just plain bizarre results. So bizarre that they ran the tape again and got completely different results and then ran it yet again and got yet again a <laughs> third set. Wow. So in other words, the tape would not give them any consistent reading or data. Mm. Now, that's weird. Yeah. <laughs> any way you slice it, that's just It's weird. morphing. <laughs> It's Each morphing. time they go back to it, yeah. Every time they pro try to process the data, it changes. Interesting. It's like a living Mandela effect. It's like a living Mandela effect, exactly. <laughs> now, I'm not at all surprised at that. You know, I, I have never advanced any speculation publicly as to why that might be happening. But I do think, given everything that I've said in all of my books about the Great Pyramid, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. But let's go back to Alvarez. He's yeah. involved in this study. And by the way, he's involved with uh, Lambert Dolphin. Right. Who later comes to do a similar study. Lambert Dolphin, if you folks don't know, is another physicist. He's also an evangelical Christian wanting to see the temple rebuilt. And, you know, he's one of these people. <laughs> <laughs> This is not the kind of guy I want to see having charge of projects like this. But, it, <laughs> but anyway. Some extremist tendencies going yeah, on. There. Well, yeah. and But Lambert Dolphin was connected with SRI. Right. You know, and and has those loose connections, therefore, to the whole remote viewing thing. On and on we could go. Mm -hmm. So back to Luis Alvarez. Luis Alvarez... I think clearly, just given his presence in this pyramid study, is a prime candidate within NASA and within the American deep state for being a member of either the magician or Masonic faction of Mr. Hoagland. Right. And possibly both. Oh, because, yeah. as you've pointed out, he does end up as one of the leading lights on the Robertson panel. And then, curiously, as you've rightly pointed out, is one of these people putting out the idea that the Zapruder film is actually showing a shot from behind. We'll get back to Zapruder in a minute, folks. Right. But there's another connection of all of Speaking of Masons. <laughs> well, there's... <laughs> Yeah, speaking of Masons, there is another connection to Alvar uh, of Alvarez, and I don't know if you remember it or not, but remember what I said in the Nazi International. When the German U-boat, U-234, and it's going to get a little confusing here because we're going to have to start talking about uranium isotopes, U-235, mm. in just a minute. So 234 is the submarine, 235 is the isotope on the submarine. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Yeah. When that German U-boat surrenders to the Americans, it surrenders gold line cylinders containing the final product of U-235 isotope, yellow cake. They already Which have the uranium developed. They already have the uranium in its final pre-metallicized form for Amazing. an atom bomb. Wow. This from the supposedly, the Nazis are behind us in every category, atom bomb project. <laughs> right, <yeah>. Okay. <laughs> They're ready this, to roll there. Right. Man. And this was on the way to Japan. Mm. Along with those fuses, we recovered Dr. Heinz Schlecke. Dr. Heinz Slicke had invented something kind of interesting. <laughs> it was an infrared proximity fuse. Huh. Yeah, ain't that handy? It's kind of a handy thing to have around if you want to detonate an implosion device. Oh, because you'll recall the problem in the in the plutonium bomb that we were having is our fuse technology would not react fast enough for symmetrical compression of a plutonium core to start a chain reaction. Mm. Infrared fuses, on the other hand, 
will react at the speed of light. Wow. And more or less instantaneously. So that you'll get that when you fire off the plutonium, the, the explosives around the plutonium, you'll get that reaction. Mm -hmm. So Heinz Schlicke was shuffled off, unlike the rest of the crew of the U-boat, was shuffled off to the Pentagon where he gave a briefing to the Pentagon brass under the chairmanship of a Mr. Alvarez. Oh. And it's that Mr. Alvarez, Luis Alvarez, who went on to win the Nobel Prize for solving the fusing problem in atom bombs. Fascinating. Which he would not have been able to do without a little donation of Nazi technology. Incredible. Yeah. So he's got a Nazi connection here too, folks. Wow. So those three factions of Richard Hoagland coalesce in Luis Alvarez. And it's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was just going to say, in addition, Alvarez has the unusual title of being able to be on one of the planes that accompany the dropping of the atom bomb to witness the whole thing. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's a deep player. That's a deep player. That is My a God. very deep player. And what's he doing analyzing the Zapruder film? Yeah. Right. Well, okay. We already know that he's got a connection to the clowns in America. Mm -hmm. So my question is, which version of the Zapruder film is he analyzing? Oh, because right. there's at least six. Yes. And they all show signs of doctoring. Yes. Oh, so, yeah. you know, forget about this thing being any sort of useful guide mm -hmm. as to what really happened there. Any, mm -hmm. any such thing. But he's certainly putting out the idea that you find on a couple of the versions of the Zapruder film that, yeah, the shot comes from behind. Back and to the left, you know. <laughs> right, <laughs> we, yeah. <laughs> we want to go to the Seinfeld route. Um <laughs> <laughs> this is interesting though because the Zapruder film I think it's interesting because they try to keep it locked up at mm -hmm. Time Life and right. Garrison got it out Garrison and then got it was it played up. not until 1975 that's 12 right. years that's right uh, and so that guy is you know ruling the roost in the meantime saying oh I've looked at it you know Alvarez is saying I looked at it it's no big deal right. certainly it doesn't prove that a shot came from the front in fact right. Anyone who analyzes it, it's pretty obvious with the yeah. Zapruder film, even with the alterations and everything, that it's the shot from. comes from the front. Yeah. Um, but him, this is interesting because this is the go-to expert. He's kind of like the Fauci yes. of the Zapruder film. So this guy, he's the one that they can point to and say, well, you don't want to take on this like famous physicist, do you? Well, let's look. Yes, let's look at the sleight of hand there because what they did was they very cleverly as you pointed out, they they shuffled attention to follow the science. Right. So we have we have Alvarez playing the role of JFK Fauci expert. Right. But the problem that people really have have yet to latch on to is that in a court of law, that kind of evidence takes second place to any eyewitness testimony. Right. You give priority to what the witnesses themselves say they saw and heard. Mm -hmm. And there, it's entirely different than the official narrative. Absolutely. So, again, you know, we're the, the, the obfuscation that was that began to play right at the moment of the assassination is, is already a, a telltale sign that you have an inside job and that they are going to try now to clamp down and control the narrative about it. Mm -hmm. and Alvarez the is, using. Yeah. yeah, Alvarez is narrative control, just like Fauci was. Right. He's there right. to lend his credentials exactly. to the whole process. That's amazing. Um, but weird dots there, too. Yeah. Because... It would have him on the Robertson panel. That's the UFO piece. And again, for some reason, there's always a UFO crisscross behind yes. in the background with the cover up of the president's uh, with JFK's assassination. But also, 
you find this weird cosmic rays pyramid seeking yes. the ancient history. So it's almost like you get evidence there of a deep mystical cult who's involved very deeply in science and yes. very deeply in assassination. Yes. Yeah. I'm not at all surprised to, to find Masons there. Mm -hmm. uh, in my pyramid books, I spent some time talking about why would you always be encountering Masons there? And when you look at the charges that a Mason hears and, and swears fealty to, even in the first three craft, you know, Blue Lodge degrees, particularly in the time of, of a George Washington or an Isaac Newton or a Thomas Jefferson, what they would have heard would be something slightly different than what you would get in a modern day Duncan's ritual, you know, the public ritual of the, of the blue lodge. Mm -hmm. um, what they would have heard would have been something like, we must learn how to turn the stream. Oh, and that's what, that's what Washington would have heard at his induction. And what that phrase means is to, turn the stream of, of superstition and uncover the scientific or real basis that's being talked about in all texts. So in other words, you are not only being asked to subscribe to an essentially materialistic cosmology, uh, you know, the grand architect of the universe simply becomes the cosmological process, in other words. Ah. And it has nothing get out of get out of your mind that it has anything to do with uh grand architect of the universe up there, we're down here, and no, it what it means is it's a process. And right. it's a scientifically knowable and reproducible process. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. So turning the stream means getting behind the, the mythological text to its scientific core. Right. So there's always this this uh, persistent undertow of atheism in masonry. That's why you kind of constantly feel it hovering just beyond what's being talked about in the actual ritual itself. It's it's kind of a, a, a presence that's there, and you have to kind of start reading between the lines of what's being said and decode it in that way. Mm -hmm. So I think within that kind of Masonic tradition, the kind of Masonic tradition that Washington would have been familiar with, or that the members of the Royal Society in Great Britain would have been familiar with, many of them Masons, that, that what you're dealing with is this attempt to recover the ancient lost knowledge. Right. That is Masonry. Yes. You know, uh, this is really fascinating because I was thinking about Washington and that incredible regalia mm -hmm. <laughs> of masonry and all the symbols of the images that they have him dressed up, you know, mm -hmm. doing his uh, Masonic ritual. It seems to me, like in his letters warning about the Illuminati, mm -hmm. that he, that this is kind of the attempt to employ the Masonic ritual on a positive yes. uh, point of view, just like the setup of America is sort of the apex of yes. we can have kind of the new Athens, you know, the new Atlantis. Yes. And, yes. Um, but something interesting happens over time with masonry where it seems like you get a split there and you get a very kind of occult workings masonry versus the actual Masonic mm -hmm. foundation. So it's a hard thing to figure out because often you find people accusing masons of everything under the sun. But at the same time, there's a weird loop with masonry, just like in the Kennedy yes. assassination, where the symbolism of masonry is involved, but it seems to be Definitely. some inverted thing that somebody's using. I think the problem, the problem with Masonic symbolism is that it can be read in so many different ways. At the time of the Royal Society, at the time of Jefferson, Washington, you have principally, in my opinion, you have principally a kind of, of, 
disguised atheism. You have a kind of materialism. And the way it's disguised is if you look at their, um, their public religious affiliations, they're basically all deistic Anglicans. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they have pretty much jettisoned belief in uh, the Trinity in a personal God or in incarnation of the logos and so on and so forth. They they've decided to retain all the trappings of the morality of Christianity while their their scientific, if you will, their scientific or cosmological philosophy has become essentially materialist and process. In other words, they have they have imbibed that Newtonian conception of the universe as a machine very, very deeply. Mm -hmm. uh, they would not have had time for the ancient view that the universe is an organism mm -hmm. because, you know, once you say that, then by the science of that day, you know, you're letting, you're letting all sorts of mischief into the picture. So this is the kind of thinking that I think you have there. The problem is, Within masonry itself, there are at least three different historical layers. There's the layer of the old charges that go back to Scotland, and that's where you really have, in those charges, that's where you really have this idea, we've got to go back and recover that lost paradise and that lost knowledge. Oh, right. Now, that very same seed is there in the Bavarian Illuminati, and that's the other side of this picture, of this mm -hmm. Masonic picture. Because when you look at the cosmology of the Illuminati, particularly Adam Weishaupt, the founder of the sect, right? he very deliberately is telling you he's going to create a secret society within a secret society. In other words a hard core within masonry that is going to imbibe his doctrines, and his doctrines are absolutely atheistic. They, there's no bones about them. Mm -hmm. But this is something that he reveals over time. But the core of his doctrine, and this is where it gets even more interesting, the core of his doctrine is, yes, like the other groups within masonry, is to return humanity to that paradisial state you know in the garden of Eden prior to the fall which he doesn't believe in anyway but to return humanity to that paradisial state but in his view that paradisial state is a state of humanity that is absolutely simple and therefore lacks all sorts of distinctions political economic, sexual. Right. In other words, what Adam Weishaupt has done is he's taken that Neoplatonic doctrine of the simplicity of God, of the simplicity of the one, and he's gotten rid of the idea that this is a metaphysical principle. It is now a principle of social organization. Hmm. And as such, what, what Weishaupt and the Illuminati really are is they're proto-Marxists. Interesting. Because they're returning you to that what? That primordial state where there is no government, where there is anarchy. Mm -hmm. And in that anarchy, all class distinctions, what? They dissolve. Right. He's the first Marxist. So you have that strain that enters very definitely, that enters European continental masonry. And that becomes a very different matter altogether than what you see in Great Britain, or for that matter, in this country. This is the problem when you're looking at masonry. You've got to be very careful to distinguish which group and what's their history. Mm, because it's eclectic history. Yes. Why is Washington saying, watch out? For the Bavarian Illuminati, which is what Weishaupt is all about. Because, because of precisely this doctrine. Mm -hmm. 
this this doctrine of 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 a paradisial simplicity to which we must eventually return. This is this is absolutely antithetical to the Anglican deists thinking with the idea of of a a natural law. And part of that natural law is that there are obvious distinctions in ability, in in talent, in in conditions under which you're born. Uh, you can't ever get rid of that. So you know this mm -hmm. is a part of their thinking that is absolutely at variance with what Weishaupt's plan is. Right. So yeah, the, you're going to have this tension. Uh, you're going to have this tension within Freemasonry. Uh, that is really reflective of what's going on in 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 Western society as a whole, because those tensions are certainly out there in public. What you're doing with with Masonry is you're founding groups that are dedicated to bringing about the political political realization of whatever these visions are. Mm -hmm. Notably, they all have one thing in common: they're all Christless. Interesting. They're all Christless. Huh. Yeah. That's a pretty big thing to leave out. That's a when you're dealing <laughs> with, when you're dealing with Western civilization, yeah. But on the other hand, let's look at the flip side of this. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why they're doing this? Right. Well, look at the alternative that they're coming from. They're coming out of uh, they're coming out of that Reformation early Enlightenment reaction, a justifiable reaction against the claims and actions of the papacy. Right. So it's a, it's kind of a pushback against it's, the power of the papacy. Yes. And let's remember the papacy was the papacy was going around burning people. Yeah. For what they were thinking. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> sounds familiar, right? Yeah, sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so the reaction, the reason why you get these reactions with secret societies is precisely when you're dealing with that kind of totalitarian uh, theocratic system and moreover a system claiming that it has a universal global jurisdiction and you better toe the line or else, you know, we're going to cut you off from your eternal salvation. Yeah, the, the reaction is, is fully understandable. <laughs> <laughs> when you see um, somehow, and I want to know what your real definition of, you know, because we hear Illuminati's bandied about. It has mm -hmm. been for decades in the alternative mm -hmm. field. They've placed it on this. When you get around entertainment, certainly – you see all these symbols that are being used and bastardized and well, everything else. Well, don't forget, Daniel, back when George Ann Hughes was alive, she read me an email from one of her listeners claiming that I was a member of the Illuminati. That's right. <laughs> because, because I had gone to the University of Oxford. You know, oh, yeah. And I, I've kept my membership card <laughs> in, in my wallet. You know, I'm a card carrying member. <laughs> What do you think, what would be a good terminology for, uh, or a good explanation, description of the actual Illuminati? The Bavarian Illuminati? Or, yes. Okay. Yeah, that Illuminati. And, and they're aspiring to be, I guess this is a two-part question, because the Illuminati as it's come down to us, and then we know there's this other thing that they aspired to be, almost like an Akhenaten style mm -hmm. mystery school. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the thing that we got mm -hmm. and why it's associated with black magic and control when you get it like Hollywood elite levels or political levels, that Illuminati, which is kind of what Washington is warning about. He's like, Hey, yes. that Bavarian thing at bay. Cause when they come over here, we're going to have problems. Um, you're asking me to pinpoint a defining feature of them. Uh, and if there were to be a defining feature to them, I would say, and and I hope people will will be patient with me because I've got to I've got to describe this very carefully because I'm trying to paraphrase a lot of what Weishaupt said in his writings 
to other Illuminati that he's writing to during his life. Um, first of all, sovereignty. When you joined that order, it was made very clear that the order claimed for itself all the power and authority of a sovereign government, including the authority of life and death. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's very clear. So in other words, you were literally pledged. This was not just, you know, fun little over-the-top Masonic oaths that you were taking at your local lodge with the boys dressed up in their horns and their fur caps and having a beer, you know. <laughs> it wasn't that at all. Uh, they they meant it. And as a sovereign organization, it was also dedicated to almost the inverse of everything that we in in public society would take as normal standards or customary standards of courtesy and behavior. In other words, it was a society ultimately and secretly given over to licentiousness and debauch. Mm -hmm. And as such, being, being atheistically material, it had room for everything, including all manner of, of black magic. It couldn't do any harm if it's, if it's nothing, then go ahead and do it anyway. And if if it there is something to it, it might work to our advantage. It's kind of right. it's kind of a a proto Heinrich Himmler attitude towards the occult. Oh, well, yeah. we might as well try it. We might get some power from it. <laughs> you know, right. That's that sort of <laughs> attitude. This this is exactly what the Illuminati are. It's mm -hmm. exactly what they are. And it's interesting because it's Crowley yes. who adopts this entire approach. Yes. yes. When we get to Alistair Crowley, he is somebody that uh, he picks up the strands of that Illuminati. Oh, yeah. And he runs it through the rediscovery of Golden Dawn. Yeah. Um, and he's our representation from the 20th century, this very same type mentality. Right. And that is a do as thou wilt. Yeah. And the other thing, uh, and again, I would not be surprised if there are not direct organizational and personnel connections between Weishaupt and Crowley, because Weishaupt, after the Bavarian government shut down his, his outfit, <laughs> <laughs> um, what he did was he fled to Frankfurt, and that ought to be a dead giveaway right there, as there is something very, very deep and bad brewing here. Hmm. Once he flees to Frankfurt, what he also, and his, again, his writings make this very clear, is that the Illuminati are not um, just restricted to acting behind a Masonic front. Go out and start as many of your fronts as possible. Coffee houses. Right coffee shops and and he he makes the point of we must obtain control of the reviewers in other words people reviewing books in in newspapers and magazines wow so that they can promote the books that they want people to read and trash the books that, i mean it, it's a it's a full spectrum wow. dominance program this guy has in mind yeah yeah, he's he's a real piece of work, folks. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. <laughs> it's fascinating to me because um, I try to get at the core of the Illuminati question, and it gets thick and it gets complex yes. because really there's also the accusation very often around groups that have rediscovered things around the mysteries but yes. instantly because they are using a kind of pageantry or symbolism that They're that's Illuminati. The, right yeah. <laughs> it must be black magic right and it's totally different completely different yeah the the underlying intention and philosophy is very very different um like i say the illuminati are not above practicing magic mm -hmm. if it will get them power right but in terms of the philosophy and cosmology of the order, they don't have one other than to obtain power. 
Mm -hmm. it, that's it. Um, with a real devoted occultist, you're dealing with something different. You're dealing with someone that actually does believe in some sort of higher power and right. actually does believe that this stuff works and has a personal investment and commitment to it. And that's all the difference in the world. Right. Uh, you know, you can, you can, you can always tell the difference between a real atheist and one who's just, you know, kind of pretending. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with, with the occult. You can tell the difference between a real occultist and someone who's just dabbling and playing around with it because it's cool. And I might derive <laughs> some, you know, I might derive some benefit from it. <laughs> well, we see that around a lot. Uh, oh yeah. In, in independent media for sure. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, there's, there's, there's really no, um, there's no inkblot test for it other than to remember that the actual real Illuminati claim sovereignty and that that sovereignty is in aid of a, a secret life of licentiousness and debauch. And all of this is to obtain power. Interesting. Joseph, absolutely fascinating insights. Stay right there and we'll record another episode dealing with Mars and Antarctica. Really incredible findings. Of course, Dark Journalist members will find it in their inbox this weekend. Go to darkjournalist.com to become a member now. Remember to follow Dr. Joseph Farrell at his website, gizadeathstar.com, and please join us on Friday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern for the X-Series. And watch for special reports on the UFO file, Obsters. See you soon.